Fighting Blindness Canada's Viewpoint is a virtual education series that brings you the latest in vision research presented by health experts from across Canada. The webinar you're about to watch is a recording. To learn more about the research we fund and upcoming webinars and events, please visit our website at fightingblindness.ca. This Viewpoint webinar is proudly presented by Bayer and supported by AbbVie, Apalis, Beacon Therapeutics, Janssen, Miera GTX, Novartis, and Roche. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoy this webinar and share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. I'm Dr. Gam. We're so happy that you could um, to join us today. So I'm just going to give a little brief um, introduction to Dr. Gam, and then we'll dive into to some questions. So. Dr. David Gam, he is a professor of ophthalmology and visual sciences at the University of Wisconsin Man Madison and the RRF Emmett A. Humble Distinguished Director at McPherson Eye Research Institute. So Dr. Gam's lab is at the forefront of developing cell-based therapies, and he's going to explain a little bit of what, what that is um, to treat retinal degenerative diseases. So for example, he was one of the first to use human pluripotent stem cell technology to derive retinal cells and the first to patent human retinal organoid technology. So um, welcome. And um, I'm really excited to talk about um, the state of stem cell research, but also about your Fighting Blindness Canada project. All right, thank you very much, Larissa. Appreciate it, enjoy being back. That's great. Um, so yeah, so we'll start off just to sort of level set us all so we're all on the same page. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what is stem cell therapy? We hear about it a lot, and we also hear people talk about cell therapy. So can you explain what those two terms mean? Uh, sure. So um, to start with, you probably kind of talk about what stem cells are in general. So um, stem cells have uh, a few unique properties. Uh, one is that they can self-renew, so they can make more of themselves. So there's really, an, once you have a pluripotent stem cell, it's, it's, it's an unlimited quantity. You can grow more and more of it if you treat it correctly. Uh, and then it has to have another property, and that is it has to be able to mature into one or more other cell types. So in other words, the ability to transform itself into something else. Um, and there are different types of stem cells. There's blood stem cells that we've known about for many, many years and used to treat patients with different types of blood cancers. Those are stem cells that are taken from our bone marrow, and they have the ability to make other types of blood cells, but they can't make anything beyond that. So those are called tissue-specific stem cells. Uh, we also have stem cells in our skin because our skin is constantly sloughing off uh, cells. And if we didn't have stem cells deep within our skin, we would eventually run out of skin and that wouldn't be a good thing. But again, those cells can only make more skin. Um, pluripotent stem cells are different in that they are um, really the most primitive type of stem cells. So they, ha they have intrinsically a capability of making every cell type in the body. And there are two types uh, in human that you can that are of human origin. One is the embryonic stem cells was originally described in the late 90s by Jamie Thompson here at UW-Madison, and a large reason why I got into the field, uh, having been trained here at the same time. Um, and then the second type are induced pluripotent stem cells, and those are taken from cells like skin or blood, but then they're genetically reprogrammed back to a state very primitive like embryonic stem cells. Um, and so the wonderful thing about that, and what it, when it first came out, it made all the news and Jamie was on the cover of Time magazine because of the promise. And the promise is, well, if you ha now have a source for all these different cell types in the body, well, then maybe we can replace cells that have been lost in the course of degenerative disease, not just in the eye, but in the brain for Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, your knee for arthritis, you know, things like that. Um, the issue then became, well, how do we harness this technology, which can do just about anything, and get it to do exactly what we want it to do and not a bunch of other stuff that might be harmful. And to do that um, um, efficiently enough where we can make enough of the cells and they're made safe enough where they can go back and do a human being and to do all the testing necessary to bring that to clinical trial. Um, and so the eye has really led the way in that regard. And uh, most of the clinical trials in, with pluripotent stem cells have been in the eye. We can talk about that. Um, with regard to your second question, what is cell therapy? Why cell therapy versus drugs versus gene therapy, things like that? The easiest way to think about that is um, that, you know, disease, all diseases exist on a continuum. So if you're very early on in your disease, you feel good. Everything's fine. Everything's working pretty well. You know you've got something and something might be coming down the pike. 
Uh, you make some lifestyle changes if you can, that sort of thing. But for the most part, everything's intact. Your systems are working. Um, later on in the mid course of a disease, you start to notice deficits. Things start to happen. You're hanging in there. Um, you know, things are still working, but not like they used to. Um, and then later on in disease, once it's really progressed, now, you know, things have really fallen apart. And, um, and what we're talking about in terms of falling apart are really the cells that make up the tissues and the organs in our body. And so as those cells become deficient in their, uh, uh, over time, they lose their function. We start to notice that in the case of the eye, we don't see as well. But towards the end of that train ride, the cells are, are die and they, they end up just degenerating. And because the eye can't regenerate right itself like the blood can and the skin can, you're just you're kind of left with, you know, the, just the deficit, the void where those cells used to be. So stem cells then provide the, a potential source for spare parts for these tissues that can't naturally regenerate themselves like the retina. Um, and so that's really the, the gist of, of what cell therapy is, is trying to replace the cells that have been lost during the course of the disease. Um, and gene therapy and drugs and, and lifestyle changes, things like that are, in, are uh, designed to stop the disease before it gets that bad, or uh, perhaps you know, uh, reverse it a little bit. But for the most part, you have to get to them earlier than with cell-based therapies. The other major thing, and then you know, this is a long introduction, but um, is that a lot of cell gene-based therapies are very specific. So you, they're, they're designed to try to correct a genetic defect or maybe even a mutation within that gene of which there can be hundreds. Whereas cell-based ther therapies are relative, relatively agnostic towards that because they're not just replacing a gene, they're replacing the whole cell, which is the, the, not, not only the gene, but all 30,000 genes that are in that cell and all the proteins and everything else that go with it. Um, so it's a more difficult thing to, to try to accomplish than just replacing a gene. You're replacing everything. But it also is more uh, generali generalizable than uh, a gene therapy. That was actually really a wonderful introduction. And you actually answered one of the questions I was going to ask, which was, are there any cells in the in the retina that can regenerate? And the answer is no, which is no. why you yeah. have to um, have um, external cells that you're putting back in. Yeah, and it's kind of it makes a you can kind of figure out makes sense the the parts of you that do regenerate and the parts that don't. It, it's the parts that you naturally lose over time. So the lining of your of your digestive system those that's out getting sloughed all the time, and um, and uh, your blood cells your, your red blood cells have you know a three month lifespan. And so if we ran out of that, which is what aplastic anemia is, uh, then you become anemic and and that's not compatible with life. Uh, but cells within the central nervous system do not naturally regrow. You know, if we have a stroke, our brain doesn't regrow. And the retina really is part of the brain. It's a very specialized uh, sensory part of the brain, but it is made up of neurons just like the brain is. You mentioned also that um, some of the earliest work in stem cell therapy is taking place in the eye. So I was wondering if you could talk about some of the clinical trials or some of the potential treatments that are already maybe out there using stem cells? Yeah, so for the most part, I and mean, so there are, you know, what we can, there's what we can make in a dish, and then there's what we're trying to get to plug into, a, you know, a living human being. So um, there's really, to be simple, you kind of break down cell therapies into two broad categories. There's spare parts manufacturer, so the cell manufacturer making the thing you want to get back into a human being, and then installation. How do you get that, that part to hook back up in an adult who has a diseased tissue? So it's not even a, a healthy tissue. It's a tissue that's undergone disease over time. And we've really made great strides uh, collectively with regard to the manufacture portion of it, to the point where um, we are able to make um, billions of authentic cell types. So it's really quite amazing. We start with a blood sample that like you might give for a, a cholesterol check. Any human being on the earth can do it. Um, and we can then reprogram those cells and then generate billions upon billions of, of uh, the cell types that are present within our own human retinas. And they have not only the structure uh, necessary to uh, do the job, but they actually can function. So a lot of the work that we've done in my lab with my collaborators here at UW-Madison and elsewhere is to really show that these cells have the capability of detecting light, not just light, but light at ambient levels that, we, that we're exposed to uh, when we walk around, different wavelengths of light, different colors. It can respond. Our, you know, our retinas are amazing uh, machines 
And uh, trying to replicate that and uh, to a meaningful level is, is not an easy task. And it turns out that these cells can do that. Um, and there are other cell types within the retina too that we generally don't think about, but are involved in, in blinding disorders, um, such as retinal ganglion cells and glaucoma. Those also have a very uh, uh, significant functional capability. And then retinal pigment epithelium, which is kind of the helper cell that for, for photoreceptors. So we can make all of those cells. So it turns out the easiest cell type to make is that retinal pigment epithelial cell, which is a, a sheet of cells that is abuts the photoreceptors in the very back of the eye and helps them to function appropriately. And those cells die primarily in a number of diseases like age-related macular degeneration, Stargardt, Best disease. And then secondarily, you have photoreceptors that die. So ultimately it's two cells that are degenerate in those diseases, but the RPE component of it, the retinal pigment epithelial cell component of it, um, for reasons I probably don't wanna get into, um, are easy to make, but easier than the other cell types. And so the manufacture of that is, is uh, quite advanced. Uh, we make them here and we make them through our company and a lot of other folks is, uh, do as well. And those have been around long enough where they have progressed to clinical trial. Um, and there've been at least uh, four to five different clinical trials for replacing retinal pigment epithelium in diseases such as age-related macular degeneration. Most of those trials, though, are required to go into patients who are, again, way at the end of that spectrum of disease. So they've not only lost retinal pigment epithelium, but they've also lost the photoreceptors that they subserve. So as you might imagine, just replacing the RPE is going to have a limited upside. Um, what has been shown, though, it's been relatively safe. Uh, the surgical approach to get them into the, uh, into the space necessary in the eye has been uh, uh, safe as well. Um, so we learn a lot from those from those uh, clinical trials, and we hope to build upon them. Um, but that's really where where we are now. There has we're now kind of on the precipice of looking at the possibility of replacing photoreceptors, which uh, well, we hope will be able to make an, an even more meaningful uh, improvement in people's visual function. So, um, as far as you know, there um, aren't any, haven't been any. Um, clinical trials with stem cells that have either improved people's sight or that have used photoreceptors. Is that, is it that? Well, there have been, a, so this gets into some of the, the nitty, nitty gritty about clinical trials. So there's different phases of clinical trials. Uh, so phase one trials or phase one slash two A trials are small trials that are designed to show safety. Um, and there has been at least one that's progressed to a 2B, which then starts to get more and more patients. And then it gets the statistics necessary to be able to really determine if, if in fact, people's vision are being improved. Prior to that, all you have are anecdotes. You have individual patients that may improve and then the next person might not and that sort of thing. So it's, you can't be definitive and say, yes, we know it's going to help X percentage of cells or our, our patients until we have enough patients that we can be confident in those numbers. And really we don't have that yet. And so um, there have been anecdotal evidence uh, in, from various trials that patients have improved their vision. Don't know exactly the, know the mechanism of that. Um, with regard to photoreceptors, there's one, uh, as far as I know, one patient who's been treated in Japan with organoids. They haven't been, they aren't necessarily photoreceptors. They're the whole retina with photoreceptors in it. Um, and one patient, and so they're kind of like balls of cells um, that have all the different cell types that are kind of like a retina with put under the retina. Um, and there was some evidence in the literature to suggest that that may be of some benefit. And I believe one patient has been treated, but there's no data that's been released from that trial as of yet. So, um, so it really is here. The idea of, of replacing those photoreceptors or trying to do that. Um, there's a, a, a thousand different ways to go about doing that. And um, there's strengths and limitations to each of those approaches. And so it's just like with RPE cells, it's important for different folks, different groups and companies to be involved in that because everyone has a, a bit of a different recipe, a different approach to doing it. And we don't know going into it, what's going to be best. Mm -hmm. Yep. So really promising, but still sort of early days. Of Definitely. Yeah. This per perhaps only a single patient in the world has been, has been mm -hmm. uh, treated with anything that has a photoreceptor in it. Okay. Um, so sort of switching gears a bit, I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about your Fighting Blindness Canada funded project. So if you could just tell us a little bit about what it is and how it's developed over the past few years. Yes. So, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to help um, humans, but along the way, um, we, we were also want to get two birds with one stone or two creatures with one stone. 
Um, there are also a number of, of dog species that have retinitis pigmentosa, and they also go blind as well. And um, in the process of trying to develop a therapy to try to treat them, we can also use that information to hopefully uh, uh, improve upon therapies for humans as well. And so we have uh, partnered with uh, a group of the University of Pennsylvania, um, a group of veterinarians who are experts in ophthalmology of, of canines. Um, and they uh, uh, have um, certain breeds of dogs that have these, these blinding disorders. And so we're developing, we're taking the uh, techniques that we've developed to generate photoreceptors and um, using now uh, also uh, different types of scaffolds. So biodegradable platforms that we can uh, insert these cells into um, and then developing ways in which we can um, insert those into the, the space below the retina in these uh, otherwise blind dogs to determine whether uh, we can improve their vision. Um, the one issue on that is that um, we are using human cells. And so uh, just like transplants from one species into another uh, don't always take, right? So if, 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 you know, that's why we have human organs that we put into humans and not other, not other species. So it, it does require a lot of immunosuppression to keep the cells alive and you know, working out those protocols so that we can do that is important. We also have a side project to try to make uh, stem cells directly from canines so that we can do canines into canines. Turns out that's a very difficult proposition because they have uh, much different genetic makeup than us. The chromosomes are different, the genes are different. So just we can't just take what we do in humans to make stem cells and, and just flip it over and apply it directly to other species. Uh, we've been successful in doing that with pig and some other mammals, but canine has been difficult thus far. And that's one of the things we're working on. And so um, there's sort of, there's so many different parts to this project. So it's the making the cells, it's trying to get them into, um, in this case, the the animal model, which, which is a dog animal model. I was wondering if thinking about maybe your research, but even the wider field, what are some of the really big challenges that you're looking to answer or correct for? Um, sort of in the next few years with stem cell therapy? Yeah, it really comes down to the the installation portion of it. So we're we're quite good at the manufacture um, and we have, you know, a, 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 an, an industry related project that we have now uh, that is uh, partnered with Fujifilm in Japan and Blue Rock in uh, Boston and Bayer, one of your sponsors uh, in Germany. And so it's a very, very powerful group of, of, uh, of, of companies that have come together specifically for the purpose of trying to uh, bring a photoreceptor cell therapy to clinic. Um, and so, um, so the manufacturer portion of it, we brought to bear just literally hundreds of folks that are, that are really bright in what they do to get that done. And it's a difficult multi, multi-million dollar proposition to do that. Um, and so the next step is really to, to kind of say, well, how do, how do we, how do we get that to, to, uh, uh, hook up necessarily within, within the, uh, the disease retina. And to that extent, my laboratory has looked at just the intrinsic capability of these cells to do that. So, um, do they even have the capacity, uh, to, um, kind of extend an arm and, and shake a hand with a cell that's already there. And we've shown in the last couple of years or so that that capability is there, now, whether or not that will actually occur once you put it into a particular person's eye that has a certain stage of disease, we actually we just won't know until until the, those studies are done. It's impossible to uh, until human into human studies are done, which are clinical trials, uh, to be able to uh, to know if that's going to be the case. But it appears as though all of the the elements are there. So the the capability we can we can test in a dish. We can test the capabilities of the cells, and they appear to be there whether they all come together and do their thing and to what degree they do that, what, you know, what is the efficiency of that process? That is something that we'll learn in the course of, of the early clinical trials. And um, I get the thing that begs the question for me about when do you think human clinical trials will be happening? I mean, obviously I know you can't give me a date, but do you think they are yeah. months well, away, years away? Well, like I said, there's already been one patient treated um, so it's here. Uh, so, it, uh, and that is a, is a product that has photoreceptors in it. It's not, again, not a purified photoreceptor product. Um, the work that we're doing, we hope if everything hits out perfectly, that we'll be uh, dosing patients in the next two, two years or so. Um, but um, again, a lot of things have to happen. The FDA have to, has to review 
our multi-thousand page document that will describe what we're doing, what we want to do, how we want to do it, um, you know, all of our safety data. Then we'll get responses from them. We'll have to address those. Um, any sort of first in human trial like this um, necessarily has a lot of caution aside, uh, assigned to it. And, and while that can be frustrating to some, and I think gets a bad rap, everyone thinks that the FDA is there just to stop promising things from moving forward. When in fact, that's not their job at all. Their job is to make sure that um, that it's safety first. People put their put themselves in harm's way when they um, sign up for a clinical trial, especially a very early stage one. Um, and just no matter where somebody is in the course of their disease, there's always something to lose. Um, even in a completely blind eye, if the eye is still in your skull, uh, then you probably want to keep it there and probably wouldn't want to lose it. Um, and that's a possibility if, if things go awry. Um, and if you have a little bit of vision, that little bit of vision is probably very precious to you. It's possible that you could lose that. Um, and so on our side, you know, as scientists and clinicians, we need to do the best we can to stack the deck in the favor of safety. But it's also the FDA's job to make sure that we're doing our job. Um, and so uh, while it's uh, slower than anybody would particularly like, I'm sure um, it is a necessary um, uh, uh, pathway to follow because Otherwise, believe me, there would be thousands of stem cell therapies out there harming people left and right. And there have already been uh, many, many uh, uh, groups and organizations that have, um, you know, under the guise of a stem cell therapy, um, put things together that uh, aren't necessarily illegal, but um, certainly have uh, are designed to just basically uh, uh, make a profit um, at the expense of uh, well-meaning but desperate people. I think that's a really important message about um, the role that some of these regulatory bodies take and also why it takes so long to get a, a, a sort of a discovery from the lab all the way to, to the clinic. There's um, a lot of experiments that have to happen, but there's also a lot of safety that people have to make sure is, is um, taking place as well. Yeah, and, and partnership and funding. So mm -hmm. um, that's the other aspect of it too. You can have a great idea, it can, look, it can show promise, but really going from the laboratory to something that is... Um, uh, able to go into a patient, that's what we call you know, the valley of death, and that can co cost you know ten plus million dollars uh, at minimum to do that. And so, um, you know, obtaining that sort of the data necessary to convince somebody to put that sort of an investment into a project uh, takes time. So, sort of thinking about um, your project, um, maybe going back to the lab a bit, because I know you're moving forward work um, with the FDA, but um, is there exciting stuff happening it, sort of in the lab-based work that you're also really excited about? Yeah, well, so most of what I do um, is in the lab. So I'm involved in the, in the company that we st helped start uh, that's interested in doing these types of cell therapies, um, but that's a minority of the, my effort in the course of a, of a week. Mostly I'm seeing patients doing surgery and then running my laboratory. So it's always an interesting situation to be in because when you're moving forward with a clinical product um, for a trial you it that's that's a that's older stuff right so you have to draw the line and say okay this is what i want to do at some point and then it can take it will take years to go from wherever you you know put your um uh, put your flag in the sand it'll take years from there to, to uh, get to clinical trial. Well, in the meantime, I'm not twiddling my thumbs. You know, we've got a, we've got a, a, a large lab here and, and we're trying to make it all better. So it's always an interesting thing that by the time you get to a clinical trial, we've already got a better product, mm -hmm. but, but it's not, but that will take three, four years for that to go forward. And, you know, everyone's going to wait and see what happens with the first one. And if it's promising, we hopefully will be able to move fairly quickly on the next iteration of the product um, or the approach or the surgical device that we use to implant this, um, the, the, the product or all of all, all of the above or the types of patients that we want to focus on, focus on that we think would have a better chance of, of benefiting from the product. So we're constantly learning, but you can't constantly in real time update your product that you're going to uh, do a clinical trial with because that requires millions and millions of dollars of testing. And if you change it even a little bit, you have to repeat those millions of dollars of testing. Um, so it's just a, it's just a somewhat frustrating, interesting, kind of crazy, uh, but necessary element of doing any clinical trials that almost everybody, when they're 
when they begin a trial, already knows how to make that product better. So you're already sort of work, working on version 2.0 as like version 1.0 is going We're, forward. Yeah, probably on uh, probably on 5.0 at this point. Yeah. The thing is you skip 2, 3, and 4 as you make it better, right? Right. <laughs> so you really don't go 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0. You go 1.0 to 10.0 to 20.0 because okay. uh, you're learning as you go. And, and, it, and, it is a, and it is a long road, road to hope. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think I might turn it over to Morgan, if you are there, because I know we've got a lot of questions from the audience. So maybe start with some of those and can always jump back in with some other questions um, if we have time afterwards. All right. Sounds good. Yes, I see the Q&A is very busy here. So we'll start with some of these. I'm going to have a read through. Um, but yeah, so let's start here. So um, we have a question from Sylvie, who's asking if the nerve was damaged due to too much pressure due to CRVO, would the optic nerve um, benefit from a stem cell treatment? So it's a great question. I get those questions a lot. Um, so not every um, cell is the same with regard to how easy it might be to even conceptualize replacing it. Um, so... I started off saying that retinal pigment epithelial cells are one of the first because they're relatively easy to make. They're also not neurons. They just, they, they're a sheet of cells and they're, they just have to be in a certain position, but they don't have to connect with anything. They just have to be abutting or close to the photoreceptors. Photoreceptors and then this other cells that are in the retina that, that ultimately connect to the brain, they're neurons. And so those neurons have to, like a circuit, like an electrical circuit, they have to make what are called synapses or connections with one another. They're very sophisticated uh, connections. Um, and some of them are very short. So the photoreceptors are very small and they make very, very short connections. Some of them are very long. The ganglion cells that are um, on the surface of the retina, they, there's 1.2 million of them and they send their, their wires or axons through the optic nerve all the way back to the brain. So replacing those cells is intrinsically very, very difficult because they have to be placed in the retina, but then they somehow have to find their way all the way back to the brain and find their one-to-one -one target within that brain. So we are not anywhere close to being able to make that happen. We can make the retinal ganglion cells. Um, they make, they'll send out axons, but getting them to do that in, a, in an adult um, is is not something that we can do yet. Now, is there promise there? Yes, there is. And there's a lot of research in that area. Uh, so a lot of funding has gone into uh, trying to replace cells for optic neuropathies like glaucoma. Um, sounds like you had a CRVO, CRVOs, um, or, or uh, central retinal vein occlusions. That's like a stroke in the retina. Um, that is a difficult situation. The, the, the optic nerve issue that you mentioned is, is secondary to that. So you, sometimes people will have that vascular occlusion or that stroke, and then pressures will build in the eye and that can cause problems with the optic nerve. But typically that's a full thickness retinal degeneration along with the optic nerve. So you're really looking in that case to replace the entire retina. Um, so that's, that's more of a, that's more of a, uh, a full on sprint. And right now we're, we're just kind of trying to, uh, to, to learn to walk. Yeah, I noticed here a question from Lucas saying just that, asking why not grow an entire retina and then connect it to the optic nerve? So I guess... The brain, there's a little yeah. thing called a brain that sits behind the eyeball. And uh, and and really uh, replacing a whole eye, replacing a whole retina or replacing the ganglion cells is akin to replacing brain. Um, and so in, er in the early days, um, uh, Geron and uh, some other groups looked into doing things like replacing cells in the spinal cord for people that had a spinal cord injury and couldn't move their appendages. That's a hard thing to do too. You can imagine putting a cell into the middle of a spinal cord. It's got to somehow find its way all the way to my, my little pink, you know, pinky finger or something like that. And, you know, while the cells could be planted and they could extend axons, they just had no, they didn't know where to go. They just, they had, they had no direction. And so they never found any of their targets. Um, and then if you think about the way our brains are made and our central nervous systems are made, it's not random. You know, certain cells have to, you know, in trillions and trillions of cells have to touch certain other cells. And recapitulating that in an adult, not in an embryo, is something that uh, we're, we're not close to being able to do now. So that's really the difference. The difference in, is in replacing a whole retina or the optic nerve versus a photoreceptor is a photoreceptor makes one connection and it makes a connection to the closest cell to it. 
Um, and so other neurons can traverse, um, well, in the case of my spinal cord neurons, a meter uh, and have to find a specific target. And so that's a much harder thing to do. Absolutely. So another question here, um, similarly, just talking about different like types of cells. So Michael's asking, you know, if stem cells could help a person with Stargardt disease and how might it affect uh, rods and cones in the photoreceptors? Yeah, so that's exactly what we're, you know, those are those are all target diseases that uh, are being looked at um, by my group and many, many others. So in Stargardt disease, you have um, a disease that's that's uh, 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 takes out two cell types. It takes out the that helper cell, that retinal pigment epithelium, as well as the photoreceptors. It's more um, focused. It's focused in the center of the retina, called the macula, which is a uh, has the highest density of cones. And cones, you know, you mentioned cones versus rods. So photoreceptors is a catch-all term. Uh, within the um, uh, the category of photoreceptors, you have rods and cones. There's one type of rod. They really don't, we use, we don't use them much except when it's dim light. Um, so in nighttime looking, you know, if we're trying to maneuver in a, in a dark theater or, or looking at stars in the middle of the night, um, our far peripheral sort of things that are moving, um, then we use rods. But in regular room lighting or, or more, rods don't even function, they're turned off. And it's the cones that are, that we use to read, to see colors, to recognize faces or any sort of detail. And there are three types. There are blue cones, red cones, and green cones. And the blue cones don't really do much either in terms of, of, of that, that high acuity vision. It's really red and green cones. Um, and so um, one of the things we're looking at and other people are how to really bias our system to making those red and green cones um, so that we can stack the deck in the favor of being able to improve visual acuity by having more of those and perhaps less but not totally de devoid of the other photoreceptor cell types. Um, and Stargardt disease, so then we're really looking at replacing retinal pigment epithelium and these red-green cones. Um, and uh, so other diseases, if you get to them earlier, it's the rods that die first. And maybe we do want to replace those rods and keep the cones that the patient has al as alive longer so that they can maintain their, their central vision and not lose it. So a lot of different um, strategies that one could uh, imagine, depending upon um, what type of, of degenerative disease you have in your retina and where you are in the course of that disease and what you need to have done. Because we often, we don't want to intervene too early and you know, cause people with good vision to lose vision. And there certainly will be a point of no return. So uh, where even um, like in the situation we talked about before, if the retina is, is fully degenerated, then you don't just need photoreceptors, you need everything. You need all the Legos. And you know, we don't know how to replace all the Legos right now. We just know how to replace a couple of different types. So we have a few questions here um, in the chat. I know Caroline was asking about um, macular degeneration, and I had a few in coming in by email as well, um, asking about would stem cell treatment be applicable for macular degeneration? Would it have to be the wet form of macular degeneration versus a dry form? Could you talk a little bit about um, how that? Yeah, is? we'll start with just what wet versus dry is. All all wet is is dry with bleeding. So um, everyone who has AMD has the dry form. And then if they have bleeding, then it transitions to the wet form. But if you control the bleeding, you still have the dry form underneath. Um, and so, and both forms ultimately lead to the death of the retinal pigment epithelium and the overlying photoreceptors. So like Stargardt disease, it's a dual cell loss. Um, a lot of types of retinitis pigmentosa uh, in contrast are just photoreceptors. That, so it's just that one cell type that's lost. Um, but in Stargardt and, and AMD, you have uh, two cell types. And so, yes, that is, you know, so we're, we're focused on diseases that lose um, either photoreceptors alone or a combination of RPE plus photoreceptors. But the more elements you add to any product, the more complex it is. Um, so replacing two cell types is harder than replacing one. Um, but that is um, a, a significant effort on our part and many other people, um, not in small part because um, and, and, you know, there is more attention given to things for which there are more people affected. Um, that does not mean if you have a rare disease that people are not interested. In fact, most of the gene therapies that we're seeing and being advanced are all for all rare or ultra rare diseases. Um, but for those diseases that affect more people, companies looking to commercialize these things certainly look at it as being a more profitable 
uh, product. And so the, they'll put the effort into that. Um, the thing that folks with say best disease and Stargardt disease should um, uh, take solace in is that macular degeneration is like you know the, the 800 pound gorilla, but that the same treatment that would be applied for AMD would also be applicable to Stargardt and best disease and other types of, of dual replacement cells. The product doesn't change. So in other words, you get to ride the coattails of a more prevalent disease. Um, uh, so, so a lot of folks, I think sometimes say, well, you know, they're not, I don't, I don't hear a lot going on about what my particular disease, um, and what you have to understand is with cell therapies, at least they're kind of agnostic. So if the underlying, um, cause of blindness is loss of photoreceptors, well, that doesn't matter if it's retinal attachments, doesn't matter if it's retinitis pigmentosa from CRX mutations or NRL mutations or whatever mutation it is. And if it's a combination of the two cell types, doesn't matter if it's AMD or Stargardt or Best disease or, or anything else, it's this, you know, the, the therapy is the same. Um, so everybody presumably would benefit. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. And I think that answers a lot of questions. Like, you know, we have a lot of questions asking, well, I have this eye disease, I have that eye disease, would this, this work for me eventually? Um, and I know you already touched on this a little bit when you and Larissa were talking um, about it, but I'm wondering if you have any more comments just around um, the amount of time. I often, you know, hear from people through our health information line, and I'm seeing it in the questions today, that people feel that, you know, research goes so slow, and it's frustrating that there are not more treatments available. Um, someone here in the chat's talking about, you know, how fast COVID-19 vaccines, for instance, got approved. Um, I'm just wondering if you could comment a little bit more on, you know, that, that process, why it's different for these types of treatments, and, you know, why that process is so important. Well, with regard to the vaccinations, vaccines have been around for a very long time. Um, so they, they, vaccines weren't invented, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. So the, the, whereas a lot of things we're talking about now have never been done before. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's not the same to say, well, we can just throw more money at it, more time and attention. If I said, I, if I was able to put a trillion dollars into landing on Neptune, I still couldn't do it in a year. I could take every penny in the entire world and I'm still not gonna be able to get to Neptune in, uh, in one year, right? There's just, we just, sometimes there's just, we don't have the knowledge. I mean, why don't we, why haven't we cured cancer? Why haven't those? A lot of times it's just, we lack knowledge in certain areas. And so we're working towards that. And once you gain them, then it's much easier to apply it a second time or a third time, right? The very first car probably took forever to make and now we can make them like that just because we have that experience over time. So we really are looking at doing things that have never, ever been done before. Um, so that's one explanation. And some things are harder than others. I mean, in some respects, we are doing stem cell therapies. I mean, patients are being treated for them. And, and in, you know, a lot of times, um, not in legitimate ways, like I said before, the snake oil portion of it, but in legitimate clinical trials as well. Um, and so the process is slow, but I can tell you that, um, uh, if that, if that process wasn't in place, so much harm would be, would be done to people, right? You would have forever for you. You want that thing so bad, but I can tell you there are unscrupulous people and people who don't know what they're doing, who would rush to treat you, would harm you and then would put the whole field back decades, right? That has happened before where we rushed, when we rushed to get gene therapy in initially, we didn't understand how it really worked. And the first, some of the first patients ended up getting um, a type of leukemia and died. That stopped gene therapy trials for over a decade, right? So you make one misstep in, in these sort of things and then every, the whole thing comes to a screeching halt. And not everybody has the same motivations than uh, as others. And so how would you know if you had, if there was no regulation whatsoever and nobody was looking to see whether or not it was even worth trying, right? Just, just throwing stuff against the wall and seeing it sticks is fine if it's, if it's um, you know, uh, uh, some dime store product and you just throw it away afterwards. If it's your eye or your brain or your, your loved one's liver or heart, then we can't be so cavalier. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that's a really important message. Um, I just wanted to go back. There was a correction from Caroline. It was not age-related macular degeneration she was asking. She was asking about myopic. And she's saying in this case, the retina is very, very thin. And would that prevent sort of the surgery, the implant, that 
kind of thing? No, no, it's a great question. Um, so myopic degeneration in many ways is treated like macular degeneration. You usually get the shots if you have choroidal neovascularization and, and bleeding. Um, but um, if there's a degenerative process, it in many ways acts much like age-related macular degeneration with the caveat being you get it because you have very long eyes, which cause your retina to be very thin. So this, from a surgical standpoint, you have to be a little more delicate with it. Um, but uh, retina surgeons um, have all kinds of experience dealing with thin, fragile retinas because those are the ones that get detached. Um, so, so no, it would not preclude anyone from undergoing a, a stem cell therapy. And in fact, myopic degeneration is an intriguing um, uh, target uh, condition for stem cell therapies that that number of individuals and companies are looking into. I have an interesting question here from Jared. That's something that I always find interesting as well. So um, they're saying if the cell therapy and the process is advancing, at what point do you decide that the therapy is good enough to try and advance to a clinical trial? I'm assuming with human subjects. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and there's a number of different elements to it. From an from a regulatory standpoint, from a, the standpoint of, of the FDA, they're focused entirely on safety. So if you can show that the product that you're making is a legitimate product, and it's not just, you know, somebody's grass clippings that, you know, you, that you just wanna see if they can help somebody see better. Um, so you have to have some evidence to show that it is, you are making what you say you're making and that they have some potential to function. But then the rest of, of all of that, that you have to convince the FDA is, of is that it's safe, that it's not going to turn into a tumor, that it's not going to cause um, um, additional vision loss to the best ability that you can. There's no way to guarantee it hundred percent, but that's their job. Um, so really it's the safety aspect of it that is the main indicator for whether you can go to clinical trial. From a practical standpoint, as I mentioned, these, you know, getting from um, discovery to a clinical trial can take 10 to $100 million. That requires good old capitalism to come into play. And so that means that companies have to be convinced they want more than safety. They want to know that this has a potential to help because they're just not in it to be altruistic. You know, at the end of the at the end of the rainbow, they would like to commercialize the product and be able to get their money back, and and then some. Uh, that's what companies do. So you know, so you have these two kind of competing things. You have the FDA going, "Hey, show us it's a, you have a, a reasonable hypothesis and that it's safe," and then you have the funders saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah," but show us it's going to work. And as a patient, you want both, right? You want it to be safe and you want it to work. So the kind of this kind of weird alliance between the two generates the, the sort of data that we have to present to be able to move it forward. Um, but it's really these two, those two elements. You mentioned before when you were talking about gene therapy and again, not understanding gene therapy and then having certain cancer cases creep up. And we've had a few questions here about that as well. So I'll just read this one from Michael. Um, he's, and they say, during a course of stem cell therapy, does the volume of injected stem cell correlate with the likelihood of these cells turning into cancer cells? Does the fact that eyes sit right next to the brain increase the probability of brain cancer? I heard anecdotal evidence that injections of relatively large volumes of stem cells for cosmetic purposes can cause brain tumors. I presume small volumes of cells are used for retinal therapy, but from the other side, if some of them turn malignant, can they travel all the way to the brain through the optic nerve or via, via blood vessels? Okay, so I, uh, that, that's a great question and uh, a nice um, uh, uh, you know, segue from my discussion about safety. So when we develop, when you develop stem cell based therapies, um, what you, what we need to do is we need to demonstrate that we can form a tumor and, and at what level we can, we can do that because we have, um, tremendous safeguards so that not a single transformable cell is in there. So it doesn't matter if we put in 4 million or a hundred thousand, we have never seen, uh, nor has anyone else that have done stem cell based therapies that are legitimate. Um, that are differentiated cell types because we don't put in stem cells. The stem cells are long gone by the time we put them into the into a person's eye. Plus, they're not cancerous. Um, they they 
when you if you put in a pure population of pluripotent stem cells, they will form what are called teratomas, which do which are tumors, which means they grow, but they grow locally. There's some they're a type of tumor that actually we see in babies and adults sometimes too um, after they're born, but they're not cancerous. They don't break off and travel and go other places. So, um, so when we develop our product, we have to do say, testing to show that there's not a single one of those cells remaining in our differentiated cell, our photoreceptor population. And they don't even trust us with that. They say, well, how do, how do you know there's not like one out of a million or 4 million? And we're like, okay, well, you know, we can't be a hundred percent sure it's not maybe one in there. So then they say, well, stick them in there. So we want you to put undifferentiated tumor, tumorogenic cells into your product and then put it into a mouse or put it into a system and tell us how many you need to have in order to form a tumor. And we have to spike our, our product and, and most people have to spike their product with 50% or more sometimes of just pure undifferentiated cells to even see a tumor. So the types of things that you're anecdotally seeing are most likely less regulated cells, cell uh, things that you're looking at for the, that that can cause damage. This is goes back to the whole, you know, going to third world countries, going to your, you know, unregulated stem cell clinic that's charging you money, and that's the way to figure it out. If you're, if it's the easiest thing in the world, there are no legitimate stem cell therapies right now for things like blindness or Alzheimer's or whatever that are advanced enough where you would pay money. In fact, it's the other way around. If you're in part of a clinical trial, we should be paying your expenses to come to, to, to put yourself in our trial. So if somebody's asking you for money, it is almost assuredly, if I would not say assuredly, something to run away from. It's snake oil, it's a scam or something like that. And if they don't know what they're doing and they're trying to scam you, then it very well be that there could be harmful cells in, in, those, in, in those products. Um, so I'm not aware of the exact you know, uh, situations you're talking to about, but if they're truly stem cells, they should have no potential to cause malignant cancer. Thank you for clarifying that uh, really important point. I wonder too, there's a few questions here about stem cell therapies currently available in Canada. And I think that's a, a good um, segue there because I do often get questions from people about certain, again, these stem cell clinics, um, particularly in the U.S. about, um, you know, if they should go to these, these particular clinics that are charging money, big no. Um, and so now, think about it. They have a, they have a conflict of interest, right? Oh yeah. They're hanging, they're hanging a shingle and they're going to tell you anything. And we're all smart people, right? But why do we believe people when they say, Hey, I've got a thing that I can just take out of your bone or your fat or whatever and stick it back in, it's going to cure everything. It's going to cure your blindness. It's going to make you run a marathon. You're going to be smarter. You're going to, you know, and for some reason, you know, we will we'll question somebody who sells us a car that looks like it's got the odometer rolled back a little bit, but we'll just swallow the stuff hook, line and sinker. So these they're, they're preying on people that have nowhere else to turn and they're charging money. So of course they're going to tell you everything. They want your money. Right. So, you know, they have a they have an inherent conflict of interest. And it used to be it was Ecuador or third world countries. But now they're here. They're in they're in the States. They're in Canada. My goodness, they just thrive in Florida. But that's a whole nother reason, uh, another reason, another discussion. Um, and they're technically not illegal uh, because of they're kind of like nutraceuticals. Right. I can sell you what if I call something a, a certain product, if I you know, if I say it's a neutral or if I take it from you and put it immediately back into you, no matter what I put into you, I could put my I could put your pinky toe nail into your eye and it wouldn't be illegal. And I could say that it's going to cure your blindness. Now, you could sue me in civil court. Good luck. I'll be gone by then. But I mean, again, there are these loopholes that are exploited. And then they use the terms like stem cells. They use these terms because they know you kind of understand them, but you don't really. And they can just pull the wool over your eyes and rob you blind and leave you blind sometimes too. And that happened in Florida. Um, literally, there, were, there was a group that was taking fat out of people and said, you know, they're fat stem cells. You know, they gotta be fat stem cells because look, we all get fatter. They gotta be coming from somewhere. So we're gonna take those fat stem cells. We're gonna stick them in your eye. They're gonna learn how to make retina and they're gonna make you see better. Guess what? Didn't happen. Caused these terrible these terrible reactions with the eye, and people lost their vision. But somebody believed that, and you know, and it's because they're convincing. Um, so, um, so yeah, we have them. We have them here too. And 
Uh, sometimes they're just taking blood samples. They spin them down. They say, oh, we're going to get the stem cells out of there. There's like one, you know, one in a million little tiny blood stem cells. But as I told you at the very beginning, blood stem cells can make one type of, of cell. What is that? Blood. So how are you going to get better? How is your blindness going to get better if you make a blood cell? And then they think then the other aspect of it is it makes magic juju. So these stem cells are just kind of, they they squirt out stuff that's really good for you. You know, it's like the ginkgo biloba of, 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 of everything that ails you. And they, and they'll, they'll say that too. It's just crazy. Uh, so anyway, um, don't fall for it. Absolutely. Um, another question here from one of our attendees, are stem cell repairs expected to be permanent? Great question. Um, it, it, we don't know. Um, I, it, we hope that they are, because if we put a new cell in there, we want that cell to be there for the, the length of the, the life of a cell. Now, cells don't last forever. You know, we don't live forever. But a photoreceptor you're born with and can be with you till you're 110 years old if you live that long and if it survives. So they have the ability to be, you know, the cells in your body, many of them, especially our neurons, can live for 100 years or more, just as long as we can live because they don't get renewed. So what you're born with is what you got the rest of your life. So theoretically, then, yes, you would only need one if it doesn't die, too. And that brings up some very good points, which is you still have a diseased eye, right? So if you put in a brand new piston into a uh, non-electric new car, you know, and the parts that are, that are, are kind of, you know, that it's plugged into are kind of rough on it then maybe it'll age faster. So maybe it won't last 100 years, maybe it'll last 50, but if you get it when you're 50, you're probably okay. Um, and the other aspect of it is, will they get rejected? So will you, uh, the, the host, look at those, those cells and say, well, they're not quite like me and I'm gonna attack them and get rid of them, like they were a bug or a bacteria or something. Um, and so that's, um, you potentially can get around that by using your own stem cells, but then that, potentially could cost a million dollars or more per person. And so there are folks that are looking into that, but economically, it's really not something that, that we feel like there's, an, that there's a path forward. So there are other ways to try and get around that immune system. Or it might just mean that people who have these transplants uh, need to have um, some chronic immunosuppression. They need to be taking some sort of medication like a patient would if they got a new kidney. Um, not ideal, but um, if it, if it uh, helps people see better, and then it may be worth it to them. Okay, I notice we're running out of time. So let's see if I can squeeze in a couple more questions. Um, here's a question from uh, uh, Pamela Lagali, and she's saying, do you think that the pathological environment in the diseased retina that results from the degeneration of photoreceptors and causes loss of secondary neurons, retinal remodeling, et cetera, would be ref refracted to the success of stem cell transplantation by preventing or impairing survival, connectivity, or function of the transplanted cells? How would you address this to try and improve efficacy of stem cell transplantation approaches? So as I mentioned before, um, stem cell therapies are, especially like, you know, photoreceptor replacement therapies are not a panacea. So there is a course of disease. So there is, you know, the early, mid, late, and end stage. So in the late stage, you've lost the photoreceptors, but the rest of your retina is relatively intact has not undergone significant remodeling or scarring or degeneration of other cell types within the retina. That's the window we're looking for. And we can hopefully identify that with very you know, common imaging equipment that's in most, if not every eye doctor's office, so, you know, OCT, uh, fundus photography, various types of angiograms, things like that, where we can try and see, do you fit in the, the window of time that would make sense for replacing one or two cell types? If you're past that point where you've undergone significant remodeling of the rest of the retina and the other downstream dominoes have already degenerated, then you are not a candidate for what I'm talking about. So the question is an excellent one and really re refers to, you know, what are we going to do about it? Well, we're going to try and not to treat those people. We're not going to try or we're trying not to, to identify and not treat the people that are so far gone that we can't just replace, you know, this, this one component. You know, if you're missing a whole leg, a new knee isn't going to help you. Right. So, you know, again, it's uh, all of my analogies. Now, are we working towards replacing, you know, ad addressing something that's at a later stage, more of an end stage where we need multiple cell types to be replaced, but perhaps those ganglion cells are still there? 
The answer is yes, we and others are working on that, but that's further down the line. That's a much more difficult um, uh, scenario and will require different strategies, not the ones that I've been talking about so far uh, today, although there's some basic principles that will be applied. Okay, and I think the final question, I'm going to try to combine a couple of questions. I have one from email and one from the uh, chat today. So what is um, something that you have found particularly maybe surprising or interesting in your recent work? And how can people keep up with what you're doing and learn more about your research? Um, well, I mean, I... Uh... So the latter one, I do direct the McPherson Eye Research Institute um, here at UW-Madison. And we do put out a newsletter uh, three times a year where we have a, an annual report a calendar. That does, that's not my lab specifically. It's, it's all of the vision researchers here at UW-Madison and across the state of Wisconsin, of which I'm very proud of all of them. Um, and so um, there, is, there is a way to... Um, if you contact the McPherson Eye Research Institute, you can be put on that mailing list. There's no obligation. We do it digitally, so there's you know no stamps, that sort of thing. So, so that is a way to stay on top of what what I'm doing. I, um, I also um, I'm very proud and fortunate to be involved in organizations like Fighting Blindness Canada and and also um, other organizations, foundations um, around the world that are interested in um, uh, cell based therapies and treatments for blinding disorders. Um, so, you know, I, I, I tend not, I tend to like to talk, so I, I'm not that shy. So, you know, it tends to get out there. Um, I also uh, want to take a little, just, just 30 seconds to say too, that this technology that we're talking about, that we're looking about to put back into patients after they've lost the, the cells in the course of their disease, it's, it's, it's perhaps, it's one of the things that we want to do with it, but another very powerful application of this technology doesn't even require it to go back into a patient. So a, a, more than half of what my lab does is we make these same organoids that have these same mini human retinas from patients with different types of blinding disorders. And then we grow the unlimited supply of them in the lab and we age them. And we look to see what goes wrong in those little retinas. It's like taking a biopsy from patients that we can't biopsy otherwise, otherwise we'd blind them. And from that, we can understand the mechanism. Why are they going blind? And then we can test gene therapies and drugs to help the folks that are earlier in the disease that hopefully never need to have their cells replaced. So I wanna emphasize the fact that the technology really spans the entire spectrum of, of blinding disorders. And it's really a, a wonderful field and I'm very fortunate to be in it and to be supported in doing it because I, you know, I, I feel like, yes, I wanna have things for people that, have, that are beyond the point of gene therapy or preservation, but boy, wouldn't it be nice not to ever get there? Um, and we have the capability of doing that using model systems um, derived from human pluripotent stem cells.